these Asian shore crabs are a really great example of what an invasive species is, which is that they're incredibly durable. This survives winters. This survives super hot weather at the same time. The resilience of these crabs uh, allow them to outlast a lot of different species and different habitats. And not only that, they're incredibly voracious. Right there. Not that one, not that one. Oh, right here. Got one right here. They'll eat the larvae of clams and oysters and other shellfish that are native to this area. Which one this one? Oh, oh so shoot. Got it, oh, dude. Got it, got, got it, it, got it. Got it. <laughs> Ow! So it makes sense for us to be eating these things or taking them out of the ecosystem. So we're cooking all this up. This is our dinner tonight. I always struggle with the elevator pitch of what Mia's actually is. Mia's can be sliced in so many different ways. You can look at it as a plant-based restaurant. You can look at it as a restaurant that focuses on seafood that's sustainable. Everything that we're doing is connected to our passion for nature. Mia itself means temple in Japanese, so uh, much of the work that we do, uh, not necessarily for me in a religious sense, but more in a spiritual sense, is a sacred place. These are all wild plants that we have over here. So we've got uh, something called dockweed. My mom grew up with this plant over here in Japan called lamb's quarters. It's got a really nutty flavor. I'm always trying to challenge myself and learn new things and new approaches to eating. I think the application may be pretty novel in what we're doing, but the reality is that uh, grandmothers the world over has been doing this forever and ever and ever. Voila, wild plant sushi. And the biggest challenge to me as uh, someone who cooks is to make food that people aren't used to something that they'd like to eat. That's not necessarily an easy thing to do. We've got a piece of invasive Kentucky Asian carp so he's gonna cut it sashimi style. It's been lightly seared in the kind of peppers called kokucharu. And we serve it with crispy black soldier fly larvae. And you've got some multi-continental, multi-era sashimi. I see ourselves as a experimental restaurant. And that's why we use insects. Um, that's why we use invasive species. In a tiny little way, we're changing the culture of eating in the space of sushi. This is the uh, Vunko roll. It's got your uh, jalapeno cashew cheese, eggplant, avocado, crunchies. It's vegan, it's vegetarian. This is sweet potato, pine nuts, and mango chutney, called the Kiss a Smiling Piggy roll. Also really popular. I did not come up with the name. My creative brother did. My mom started the first traditional sushi restaurant in New Haven a little more than a decade ago. My brother, who's been in the business pretty much the whole time. He was very much a pioneer from the sustainability movement. So we became the first uh, sustainable sushi restaurant in the world. We had to actually start eliminating a lot of the key things from the menu. So redfin tuna, things that are harmful to the ocean. Just being more mindful and that's where we end up serving invasive species. And why not try to be part of the solution by eating these things when they can be yummy. I don't think that anything that we work on is trendy because everything that we were working on wasn't popular when we were doing it. The challenge had been creating a cuisine that was very, very different than what people expected. You know, a good decade of my life was spent living in the basement of Mia's, not being able to afford a car, and worked seven days a week in practicing and creating and practicing and creating, first doing traditional sushi and, then, and so on. When I introduced the plant-based sushi and new recipes based on sustainability, there were a lot of people who were definitely disinterested to the point where they'd open up our menu and just be like, mm, this isn't sushi and walk out. I had plenty of people who would lecture me back in those days, telling me that well, what I'm doing is not sushi at all. We had a lot of people that were into it and then we had a lot of people walk out the door. And at first, um, I don't think my mom got it. I'm not even quite sure if I did what was going on, but you easily catch on and it's interesting and you realize what an impact it has on everything and living thing and how we're all connected and it's fascinating.
Well, these are guys that I went to high school with. Frank and I wrestled together, right? Yeah. Uh, and then was a big, big wrestling star at Yale. And today he's my physician. And then my spiritual leader over here. <laughs> Tell me about yourself. I, I look up to you, bud. Oh, yeah, look at that. Is that great? I know. I mean, guys that I grew up with, still here. And why do I look a lot younger than these guys? Because I eat my vegetables. There you go. Yeah, That's there you right. go. There you go. Mia's is, uh, is definitely a family restaurant by every definition. And this restaurant's really small right now, but man, it's gigantic compared to where we started from. So uh, even before there was a farm to table, uh, my mom had a little garden and, and she was growing stuff for Mia's. Not a whole lot has changed because on our farm today, my mom oversees all of the growing. Though we do cultivation on our land farm where I live, much of it is dedicated to wild plants. So over here we got some um, Japanese shiso. The Japanese basil over here, we grew up eating shiso a lot. So it just started, so everything's wild and kind of just coming out of the ground right now. Oh, wow. This is just, it just literally reminds me of Japan. <laughs> so my mom grew up doing all this as a kid. This is what we call foraging now. This is wild mugwort. The pilgrims brought mugwort from the Mayflower and it's known to have medicinal qualities. I grew up foraging with my mother. Today we understand that uh, wild plants are exponentially more nutritious and often much more tasty as well than anything that you can possibly get that's cultivated, so it makes perfect sense. Every See, everywhere time, she goes, she spots something you can eat. Um, this one is master cream. It's good. I'm not worried about the insect. I eat. Because there's no pesticides anyway, so, yeah. A lot of things eatable. Our mom grew up in Yamaguchi Ken, Japan, rolling beautiful hills very outdoorsy, and she's always loved gardening. Both of my parents always loved the outdoors, and so it's kind of like it came full circle into what we're doing today. I have two more sisters, younger and older, but I'm the only one who loves outside, so my mother didn't like it. I was just uh, happy to Curious. be in the nature. Yeah. Yes, so it's never go away, even you're older. Mm -hmm. You love nature. So I think that's the key to be happy. Mm -hmm. And that's what you did with Ban. You let him. Yeah, I did it to mm -hmm. Ban, yes. He loved nature since he was very little. So Ban always had a lot of energy. <laughs> yes. yes. Yes, always. He disappeared so many times. <laughs> I couldn't find him. So I was uh, really, um, walk, um, looking for everywhere. So I went to the place where I used to take him. And uh, on the mountain, on top of the mountain, he was there. Only 50 months old. If I talk about my son, I can, I can write one book. <laughs> <laughs> Life with Bun, a never a dull moment is what I could say. Keeps you on your toes. I mean, he's still kind of a kid, right? His hand's always in the dirt playing with bugs and wild plants. And he was always that way, always outdoors. We're going down Branford River, which is connected to Thimble Islands, which is uh, the most treacherous uh, part of this area for boats because uh, there's so many underwater craggy rocks to hit. And I've hit a bunch of rocks over the years, but I'm pretty sure I know where most of them are right now. And it turns out where these rocks are are also some of the best places to go dive for seaweed for us to eat. I haven't been boating for all that long. The, the reality is that uh, when I was growing up, I couldn't afford uh, a yacht like this. <laughs> look how far you've come. Oh, look at that, yeah. man. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> couldn't believe it. Best investment I've ever had. I, I love boating culture, too. Look, you just wave, and everyone's so nice. Look at that. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> yeah, you know what he's, that guy's thinking? He's like, you little surfs, you know? <laughs> Okay, we're gonna go to this really craggy area. We're gonna go diving over here for um, seaweed. So I'm just gonna jump in right now. 
right over here is a non-native wakame seaweed. Uh, it's from Japan. Sea vegetables are more nutritious than most land vegetables because there's so many nutrients in ocean water, but it's also easy to be contaminated. And that's why we're not collecting this from the shore, but on around this little rock island. I, I think one of the first words that comes to mind when thinking about Bun is, is insane. He's, he's pretty crazy. Can't be good for the boat. <laughs> this is such a Bun maneuver. Like anchor up while just constantly getting buffeted into rocks and be like, it's fine. <laughs> But if I think about it more, I would say that Bun is primarily generous. He's one of the most generous people that I've ever known. Ahoy! You guys want to race? Uh, they would beat us, actually. <laughs> they would totally beat us. Dragnet. He is very childlike in both his curiosity and also his enthusiasms and also how easily he's distracted. Like, both one of the joys and challenges of working with him. Wow, look at that catch. I'm so excited. <laughs> that's as good as seafood gets, right there. Shiners, a fish that's abundant on the bottom of the food chain as well, so has very few uh, contaminants, and it tastes incredibly good. Okay. I can feel them thrashing. Ugh. Thank goodness we're strong. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> hey, Patty. Hey, buddy. Okay, here we go, Patty. Patty doesn't like weeds. <laughs> Tonight, what's happening tonight at the house? We're gonna have a party, but it's not uh, your usual barbecue that most people have. The cool thing that we're gonna do is uh, have everyone experience something that uh, they haven't had before, which is yeah. weeds. My family ended up in New Haven because my father's first job after he finished his doctorate was here at Yale University. So I grew up in laboratories. What I learned from my father was that whatever we did with our lives, it was important to do something that would have some sort of benefit beyond your career or making money or getting famous. What I learned from my mother was that it wasn't enough to make tasty food, beautiful food, it had to be accessible food too. Weeds are hardier than cultivated plants. It makes sense to keep these weeds and eat those along with whatever you're gonna be cultivating. And that's the idea. I'm not against farming, and I'm not saying people should go out and eat just wild. But I'm saying, well, there's five billion pounds of pesticide that go into the ground every year. Why not stop that and figure out ways of integrating other species that coexist along with whatever we're planting? Yeah, we've got a bunch of baskets. Can you carry all the machetes, actually? Oh, sure. Super psyched that you guys are here. You guys are some of the most amazing people that I do know. So while you are here, please do not be shy. Reach out, make new friends, because ultimately, everything that you do with food is, and it's gonna sound corny, but it's about people. We're gonna do some cool stuff with food today. Um, hopefully, you get to experience an approach to eating that you haven't experienced before. I mean, this has evolved. Uh, over the years, and that's really uh, through collaboration with the community, and not just the community of New Haven, but people we work with uh, from all around the world. Let's cut a few of these things to bring, all right? So the ones that cut are the leafy ones, all right? And stay away from each other. Nobody who ever creates anything of any importance ever does it without the help and inspiration of others. Essentially what we're, we're making is the way sushi used to be made before it was Japanese along the Mekong River or Yangtze River um, where rice first started. 
God, this is delicious. And I really didn't do anything, like <laughs> literally. You know, sometimes it's the simplest things that are the best. So let's start making it. Sometimes I create really good stuff. And, and sometimes, uh, like every experiment, it's not so good. And throughout it all, throughout the entire journey, through decades and decades at Mia's, we've had New Haveners and beyond supporting us. Yeah.